This is Crow Inquisitors, and we're back with another behind-the-scenes look at Crow Inquisitors and the world of Saragon. Hey guys, it's been a while, hasn't it? I am excited to get back into uh, all of this stuff and uh, continue talking about Crow Inquisitors, Saragon, the world, world building, all that stuff. So last time we did a um, just me talking to the mic about uh, character change and burning wheel and uh, all of that brings. In, in the game uh, today we're gonna we're gonna talk about lore we're gonna talk about Saragon itself the world of crow inquisitors um and kind of dig into some more behind the scenes stuff along those lines so Saragon is the first serious attempt at world building I ever did um it's Genesis really has uh, it, it comes from uh the first uh, long-running role-playing game cam- campaign I ran uh, called The Savage Tide. Um, you can find out more about that, and we, we talk about it on uh, my other podcast, Idle Inspiration, where we talk about role-playing games. Me and David, uh, who plays Dellen and Crow Inquisitors, uh, talk about uh, role-playing games and um, our favorite role-playing games, our experience with the role-playing games, all, all that stuff. Um, so I'll link that in the liner notes if you're if you're interested. But uh, that that campaign, which was a uh, Dungeons and Dragons 3.5 edition campaign using the uh, Savage Tide Adventure Path by Paizo uh, that came out in Dungeon Magazine between 2006 and 2007. Um, that uh, campaign is the genesis of this campaign of Crow Inquisitors, really, uh, because basically when we were looking at Savage Tide and when I was looking at Savage Tide as, as a dungeon master, um, I wanted to, I wasn't particularly interested in the world of Greyhawk, which is the world that uh, the Savage Tide takes place in standardly, uh, according to the Savage Tide Adventure Path. They have, I think they have conversion rules for if you want to put it in Forgotten Realms or Eberron uh, as well, but uh, Greyhawk was the standard kind of default campaign setting at the time of 3.5. Um, but as I was looking around at the stuff uh, that Greyhawk offered and the, you know, the deities and all that stuff. I was like, eh, I don't know. Let's just make up our own thing. Let's, let's make it our own. And so we ended up doing a, uh, I, I ended up doing an overhaul of the setting, renamed a bunch of deities, made up new deities, um, based on stuff that we were interested in, uh, made a map of the world that still didn't ever really get filled out entirely. Uh, I remember I, I used to, I, I, w- I was like slowly going through and filling in sections of the world uh, in this giant map that I had outlined. Um, never, never finished that, but yeah, started a kind of a 3.5 campaign setting, um, which to be honest, I'm not sure if it was named Saragon at the time. I'm not sure where that name originated or when it did. Uh, but either way, that was the campaign setting we were using, and um, a lot of the gods that uh, are in Crow Inquisitors that you notice, uh, Atarian particularly, um, is uh, is a god from that original campaign. And, and what ended up happening is we got pretty deep into Savage Tide, into the, um, the campaign. And I realized that I was interested in uh, fantasy writing, in, in writing fiction. And so what did I do? Of course, like, like every good starting fiction writer, I, of course, try to adapt uh, a role playing game into a book, which is not really a thing that I suggest doing. Uh, then in most fiction writers won't suggest that you do that as well. Uh, it's just there's too much wrapped up in um, out of game stuff that makes a role playing game fun uh, that doesn't quite translate over to fiction. You can't just write out your the adventure log of your campaign setting and have it be an interesting novel uh they're different mediums and they do different things um but basically what i was doing is i i I took a look at 
Um, well, obviously, I couldn't write a book based off of the Savage Tide Adventure Path because that's a copyrighted story already. Um, but I took the the kind of backstories we had developed for the various characters uh, of that campaign, um, such as Pottle Flip Flop, Dagoth, Zaydanok, Dalis Eagleheart, Nimlar Sumel, Striker Moonscar, uh, Jericho Moonscar, Striker. Uh, all of those characters who those names probably sound familiar to you if you're familiar with me or um, our, our conversation about Savage Tide on Idol Inspiration. But those characters interested me. And so I wanted to write a novel about them and about their stories. But it did end up being uh, a pretty different thing than the Savage Tide Adventure Path by necessity. Um, but the backstories were more or less the same. I was, I was kind of writing from their perspectives. And I ended up writing, I don't know, like 100,000, 120,000 words in that novel. Uh, I called the first novel Incipient. It was part of a, a longer series called The Proenati. You know, this world, this it's kind of part of, or at least was in my mind, part of this overarching series called The Proenati. Um, uh, that was about uh, these characters that would uh, change the world. Uh, and it was going to be like a multi-generational thing there were, there's going to be a lot about the, the Savage Tide characters, parents that were interesting. And then, uh, the Savage Tide characters themselves and then the Savage Tide characters descendants. And it's going to be, yeah, this multi-generational book series. I wrote 120,000 words of one novel and then gave it up, uh, partially because as I wrote it, I realized that I wasn't where I wanted to be in terms of storytelling. And by the end, by the time I got done with part one of the book, um, I was like, yeah, I want to change everything about this world. Um, and, and that's really where the shift started happening, right? The world of Saragon beforehand, right? When I was starting to make a new thing that wasn't based on Dungeons and Dragons, right? It wasn't, it wasn't a campaign setting anymore. So I revamped it and made it a fiction setting, but it was still a uh, heroic classic fantasy. So orcs, elves, dwarves, like all those were there. Um, magic more or less worked the same, right? Like it's, it's, it was a ripoff of Tolkien, um, right. As, as a lot of fantasy was, uh, leading up to the eighties and nineties. And, um, but, but, but by the time I got done with writing part of that novel, I was like, you know what? I should make this something that is my own, right? I, I don't want this to be elves, dwarves, orcs, so on and so forth, right? I want this to be, um, my own thing. And if I had the chance to go over and do it again, right, I wouldn't have um, done it in this sort of like long form, organic, messy process that I ended up going through to get this world. Um, because, you know, basically the way it worked, right, is I, I would I would notice something that would be cliche, fantasy cliche in the world. Oh, these are elves. Oh, I just have a bunch of just different elf sub races. Why do I have this? Let's make them their own races but they were still intricately tied to their origins in a way that I couldn't shake loose, right? So the world of Saragon, if you pay attention, you're going to see those uh, connections, right? Um, the dragon bloods of, um, uh, of the world of Saragon, which we've, I feel like we've mentioned a few times uh, in Chrome Inquisitors at this point, um, right? They, they, that came from one of the players of Savage Tide played a lizard folk dragon shaman so he's a lizard folk but he, he had a lot of dragon stuff going on and uh the world of saragon has these dragon blooded lizard like humanoids that are very very similar to dragonborn in in um fourth and fifth edition of dungeons and dragons though i didn't really i, I wasn't basing them off of those those races when i when i made them um it's just kind of a, a coincidence there but uh, th those exist because of that particular quirk of the campaign that we were playing in in that original role playing game setting. Uh, but I liked the idea of a race of you know dragon people, uh, humanoid dragonoids, you know, sort of things that worshipped dragons as gods, right? Um, and that became a whole thing where uh, you know in the in the official Saragon history, um, all these deities, the stewards, right, as we've called them. Um, chose different peoples kind of split off from this main proto race that existed at the beginning of history and split each of these like basically gathered peoples to themselves and said ah yes you're gonna be my people and then shaped them according to their desires and, and they became all the different races that exist in saragon which are at their root 
based on the classic Tolkien-esque fantasy races, but have been changed enough at this point in in the final iteration of the world of Saragon uh, that they are they're their own thing, um, and they're honestly more related to the cultures, the human the human cultures that I've based them on more than anything else. Uh, though there are physical uh, differences as well. But one pair of stu- uh, one group of stewards took a uh, uh, one of these peoples and ch- made them into like lizard like dragonoid sort of humanoids. Um, and there was there's a whole backstory thing in in the history about like how the other guys didn't like that and were like you're going too far. Or it's like this weird kind of like science fiction like you're not supposed to make them not be humans anymore. Or, like they're the these people are supposed to look like this. You can't make them into dragons. That's weird. And there's like a war that happened. Um, but uh, yeah, so stuff like that, right, still exists in Saragon as a result of that first kind of um, initial thing. Um, but yeah, the world of Saragon, let's talk about the world building, right? So uh, we've already talked a little bit about the nine disciplines. Um, and the nine disciplines, honestly, is probably the most original idea that I've had in the world of Saragon. Uh, even then, it's still not entirely, I'm still not entirely happy with it. <laughs> Let's just say that. So right before uh, or right after I kind of finalized the nine disciplines, I finalized the the setting of Saragon, uh, the setting in which Chrome Quizzers takes place. Um, that was when I really started to get into a renaissance of my own tastes in fiction and started reading Brandon Sanderson. Uh, I read The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson, and then from there read his other stuff. And if you know anything about Brandon Sanderson, you'll know why I had a renaissance there, because I suddenly was, my my eyes were opened to the possibilities of fantasy, right? The, the, the types of world building you can have that are fundamentally unique and fresh um, and take the best things we love from fantasy and give them a little twist. Uh, and so we really started going, me and me and my friends, as we were, we you know, had conversations about world building and we're very much involved in, in that kind of sphere of, of hobby. Um, we would make up our own um, hard fantasy magic systems, right? Uh, the ones that have a lot of rules uh, that, that are supposed to have logical consistency and, and internal uh, coherence, co- uh, cohesion. Um, and the nine disciplines were like the very first part of that era, or I think probably more likely, since I can't remember exactly how it went down, uh, the very end of the previous era. Um, right. It was right before I really started figuring out what I wanted to do with fiction and what I wanted to do with world building. Um, but the nine disciplines are certainly unique. Um, they're a lot of fun. Uh, I really I like the system. But again, the the way that Saragon came about was so was such an, a messy organic process. Uh, you know, evolving out of this old campaign setting that if I had the chance and Crow Inquisitors wasn't canon. Right, I, I I like Crow Inquisitors too much to not make it canon of the new kind of um, overarching RPG interconnected world that we're starting to develop with these shows. If I didn't like it so much, I would just scrap it entirely. Uh, I would I would scrap the world of Saragon. I would I would destroy it uh, because it's just too, you know, the, I could do better. Right, I, I can make something better, um, but uh, it has a lot of charm. And it has a lot of good things going for it. And so I, I don't say that to say like, yeah, this world sucks and you shouldn't pay attention to this show. It, it has a lot of fun stuff going for it. Um, and it, when I decided to to make Chrome Inquisitors part of the new canon of our kind of interconnected um, RPG Cosmere, as I like to call it, um, where we have various shows that are all technically in the same universe, uh, Chrome Inquisitors, Lavender Shadows, Death into Madness, uh, and a few a few other shows that we've done are part of a, an interconnected um, fantasy uh, setting, similar to Brandon Sanderson's Cosmere. Um, that's when I was like, okay, I am going to redeem this. Uh, and honestly, we're getting pretty close to going back to uh, another season of Chrome Inquisitors, doing season four of Chrome Inquisitors in 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 our regular timeline of shows. Um, obviously, you're you're getting these episodes released, uh, edited, you know, from 2016. Um, and then I edit them and, and put them out, but, um, we've done two seasons of Chrome Quizzers after that, and, and we're going to return for a fourth season. And I, I'll definitely have to sit down and really think through, um, you know, the, what is the canon of this show? Part of what I'm, what's fun about doing these podcasts 
is that I get to go through and edit out a few things that just I don't I decide aren't, aren't canon anymore. Right. The the official canon of Chrome Inquisitors is this podcast. So if you're watching the YouTube videos and something gets said that isn't in the podcast, that's not canon. Um, this is the final version. And it gives me a little bit of a chance to rough out those edges uh, to decide what this world really looks like and to kind of, again, you know, uh, finalize, make the version. You know, it's like when you you have uh, a paper to write or, or some some document that you name final and then you have to keep changing. And you name it final, final three, final, final four, final, final, final five, you know, dash six. This in theory will be the last one of those and it will definitely seem like i've added a bajillion finals onto it um but that's just kind of the way that saragon developed and uh too late to stop the the train track now uh to, to stop the ride now uh we're already going so saragon again based on original campaign setting uh that was very tolkien-esque very D. Um, and has since evolved into something different. And, and honestly, um, where we are in Crow Inquisitor, Inquisitors right now in, in the um, kingdom of Sauron, um, Sauron um, came from uh, that campaign setting. Uh, you know, as I, as I said, all, almost all of the, the main stuff that, that we've been doing in Saragon uh, is originally from uh, that D&D setting that I started developing way back when and then has just had a bajillion iterations that have changed it ir irrevocably. Um, but the thing with Saron and Teko and the situation that we're kind of in right now, the, the part of the world we're in, it is probably some of the most fresh stuff that I have. Um, and I think that's mainly because we were forced to flesh it out. Right. Um, I knew some stuff about Saran. I knew some stuff about Teco, uh, but I was as we play this campaign, we learn more and more about those situations. Uh, and, and as I make the podcast here and, and make some extra lore, uh, make that fiction uh, that you, I've been releasing, um, I also figuring out more myself about how it all works and fits together. Um, and I imagine it will be the same whenever we go to a new place in this setting. Um, we'll have to to flesh it out more and, and come up with. Um, more original and unique ideas to really make it feel feel fresh and interesting. Um, but as of right now, if if I was to give you the lowdown of like every kingdom, every race, which I won't do because that would take a while, um, you'll definitely start picking up the the cliches uh, hidden in the um, in the rough there, uh, in the um, the whole picture uh, of each of these these places and and, and peoples, but. I think the main thing I wanted to talk about, you know, uh, as we've kind of discussed uh, world building today, uh, is just that that organic process, um, right? Like, this is why I actually like. Um, so let me let me let me frame it this way: the sort of organic process that happened to make um, Saragon into what it is uh, that that went from. You know this campaign setting in a D and D what like world, and then continued to evolve over time into something that looks very different. Is not it was not ideal. It was not the ideal way to do it. Um, and especially because coming into a setting like this, um, and and starting the campaign of Chrome Inquisitors, it there was a lot of baggage that came with it especially when we're, we're playing a new game like the burning wheel and immediately I throw out all the rules for magic in the burning wheel and we use our entirely other system, right? Uh, based on the stuff that I'd already written down. That's not how I would suggest going about doing this. If you were to start a burning wheel campaign, if you just start any campaign, honestly, don't do a whole lot of prep work on the setting itself. Um, you should broad strokes, very broad strokes. The thing with Saragon is that I had spent so long detailing it that I came in with certain expectations and I really had to kind of play fast and loose with those expectations uh, as my instincts to make a good story kicked in as a GM. Uh, and some of the best stuff about the campaign has been stuff that was certainly not in my original notes about the setting. And, and, and so I say that to say um, organic world building is great, but not the way I did it, right? Because I was doing it for... Um, a different thing entirely and then just decided to throw some characters into a world um 
the, the 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 one of the things that I think is best about role playing games is that you guys get to you and the players get to make the setting together, right? Based on what you're interested in. If I was to do Crow Inquisitors again, if I was to restart everything, go back from the beginning, I would start a campaign knowing nothing except for maybe yeah, if we wanted to do like the same sort of setting, right? Let's say it is Saran. Uh, they are there is a church, a corrupt church. There is a suicide squad kind of um, uh, of criminals sent to do the bidding of the church. That would be all I know, right? I, that would be the only broad stroke I'd make, and then we would let the rest of the the game just evolve organically and naturally uh, as we play, right? The, the kind of messy organic ev- evolution I'm referring to with Saragon is the type that is messy because the purpose of the world keeps changing, right? At first, it's a campaign setting. Then it's a fiction setting. Now it's a campaign setting again for a different role-playing game. Uh, that just doesn't lead to cohesion. Uh, and and it, it leads to some messiness that that um, ends up making the fun less uh, lesson in, in, a, in the role-playing game itself, right? The fact that the nine disciplines work the way they do is fun in a fiction setting, but isn't the best for, a, uh, for, for the burning wheel right for the game we were playing and as we've continued on with crow inquisitors i've actually very much just grabbed the way that the burning world deals with magic and and made it made the nine disciplines work as close to that as possible so that the game we're playing doesn't fight the story we're telling uh and, and the world building um but yeah if, if i was to do it again i would have the broad strokes there of the the the, the church the kingdom the suicide squad and then i would ask the players a lot of questions right? I would fill in the world as we go. I would ask the player, hey, you're from this kingdom. What is it like? And we do some of that, right? I asked the players for cultural traits for, for uh, Saran and that, that really helped me fill out the, the world there. But I would, I would have come in with zero expectations about any of the stuff um, because as, as we play Crow Inquisitors, I keep, I'll often bring up stuff about the world and be like, well, this is the way the world works because of stuff I already know, which is helpful to have an answer in the moment but doesn't always lead to the best situations, right? So, so I give an answer to a character and they're like, well, that's dumb. That doesn't actually help me in this situation. And now I don't know where to go with my character as opposed to I, I can see the problem they're having and I can see that they want a solution that is helping with the world building. And, and, and this really works. This is why wises are great in Burning Wheel, right? You roll a wise to, to one of the ways at least you can use wises, you know, like sword wise or kingdom wise or whatever, city wise or whatever. Um, is you can make up details about the world. And we, I definitely allow the players to do that. Um, I allow David to, to make up a bunch of stuff about the, the religion. Um, but I wish I had just done more, right? I wish I had started off with almost no expectations and allowed all of our understanding of the world to come from play itself, um, right? Like, that doesn't mean to say that I, I wouldn't come up with stuff as a GM in between sessions as we make the world together, but I would do it based on the um the um impulses the the um uh oh, what's the word i'm looking for um the uh pushing that i'm getting from the players right um the 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 impulse i know there's another word that describes what i'm talking about but yeah the impulses i'm getting from them um the the direction that they want to go those those markers those indications that i'm getting from them as to what they're interested in and then I can say, okay, well, cool. Uh, obviously, we know religion is going to be a big part of this. Let's keep fleshing out the religion, um, but with no expectations going in beforehand of exactly how it all works, so that we can kind of come up, come up with it together to help, um, you know, so that the answers to the questions we're asking p- continue to push the narrative forward in a way that's interesting to everyone. Um, so yeah, I, if I was to do it again, I would go back to the beginning. And I would, the world of Saragon would look very different. Um, we would base it on uh, what the characters are interested in, what the players are interested in, what uh, me as a GM is interested in, but only after getting those indications from the players uh, and then and then flushing it out as that kind of back and forth happens. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of, of anything else world building wise I wanted to discuss. Obviously, we have the stewards. We've talked about the stewards before um, and, and they're... There's a lot of stuff going on in the world of Saragon uh, and in the further cosmology, the, 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 out, the kind of bigger stuff um, that's connected to Lavender Shadows and Death into Madness and uh, other shows we've done. 
um, that we're going to find out more about. Um, and I'm excited to do so. I'm excited to um, now going through these games uh, with the fine tooth comb and making the final versions. I'm excited to to really let that initial impulse, right? That initial indication that I have as a GM to let the players decide what's interesting to them, guide my pen as I edit these, my proverbial pen, as I edit these, uh, these episodes. And we, we kind of coax the final story out of um, these sessions that I've been, you know, five years ago, um, still a part of my life, uh, even now, as we continue um, playing on that mega setting. Um, and, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of stuff that I, I, I've mentioned here that just doesn't make any sense to you guys, right? That, um, is not exact, like th- I'm, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of names out, right? I'm throwing a lot of concepts out that aren't entirely explained yet, either in Crow Inquisitors or in, uh, Isle Inspiration, the, the podcast where we talk about some of this stuff. Um, but don't worry, there'll be time for it later. Uh, you've, Crow Inquisitors is the beginning, just the very beginning, the tip of the iceberg, of a, of a long, fun road ahead of us um, with a lot of fun stuff going on. And not all of it's going to be in the mega setting. Not all of it's going to be in this connected epic fantasy setting that um, I'm starting to develop here. Um, well, I guess Hellbreaker sequence is part of the setting too. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Terra Nullius, Terra Invicta, uh, Elysian Road are part of their own kind of things. Um, but uh, they all kind of, you know, fill the, the, the bibliography, as it were, of uh the the um the docket uh, what's the word i'm looking for i'm uh, um the uh resume um catalog catalog is a good neutral word for that uh the catalog of stories we have um going on in the channel um and uh in the future we'll we'll continue going uh in, into further depth with each of those as we make these podcasts and continue to see these connections so don't don't fear don't worry um we'll talk about this more in the future uh but i wanted to give you guys a little piece uh of the world building of saragon um and uh you know i don't i i didn't want this episode to be me reading off a bunch of old notes that i had i wanted to give broad strokes as to reasons as to why the world shakes out the way it does and to what to look forward to in the future so there you go that's been chrome inquisitors behind the scenes we'll be back tomorrow very exciting with episode eight of chrome inquisitors <laughs>